The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. In about a minute somebody spoke out of a window without putting his head out, and says, Be done, boys. Who's there? I says, It's me. Who's me? George Jackson, sir. What do you want? I don't want nothing, sir. I only want to go along by, but the dogs won't let me. What are you prowling around here this time of night for, hey? I want prowling around, sir. I fell overboard off of the steamboat. Oh, you did, did you? Strike a light there, somebody. What did you say your name was? George Jackson, sir. I'm only a boy. Look here. If you're telling the truth, you needn't be afraid. Nobody'll hurt you. But don't try to budge. Stand right where you are. Rouse out Bob and Tom, some of you, and fetch the guns. George Jackson, is there anybody with you? No, sir, nobody. I heard the people stirring around in the house now and see a light. The man sung out, Snatch that light away, Betsy, you old fool. Ain't you got any sense? Put it on the floor behind the front door. Bob, if you and Tom are ready, take your places. All ready. Now, George Jackson, do you know the Shepherdsons? No, sir, I never heard of them. Well, that may be so, and it mayn't. Now, all ready. Step forward, George Jackson. And mind, don't you hurry. Come mighty slow. If there's anybody with you, let him keep back. If he shows himself, he'll be shot. Come along now. Come slow. Push the door open yourself. Just enough to squeeze in, do you hear? I didn't hurry. I couldn't if I wanted to. I took one slow step at a time. And there weren't a sound, only I thought I could hear my heart. The dogs were as still as the humans, but they followed a little behind me. When I got to the three log doorsteps, I heard them unlocking and unbarring and unbolting. I put my hand on the door and pushed it a little, and a little more till somebody said, There, that's enough. Put your head in. I'd done it, but I judged they would take it off. The candle was on the floor. And there they all was, and looking at me, and me at them, for about a quarter of a minute. Three big men with guns pointed at me, which made me wince, I tell you. The oldest, gray and about sixty, the other two thirty or more, all of them fine and handsome, and the sweetest old gray-haired lady, and back of her two young women which I couldn't see right well. The old gentleman says, There, I reckon it's all right. Come in. As soon as I was in, the old gentleman he locked the door and barred it and bolted it, and told the young men to come in with their guns, and they all went in a big parlor that had a new rag carpet on the floor, and got together in a corner that was out of the range of the front windows. There weren't none on the side. They held the candle and took a good look at me, and all said, Why, he ain't a Shepherdson. No, there ain't any Shepherdson about him. Then the old man said he hoped I wouldn't mind being searched for arms, because he didn't mean no harm by it. It was only to make sure. But he didn't pry into my pockets, but only felt outside with his hands and said it was all right. He told me to make myself easy and at home and tell me all about myself. But the old lady says, Why, bless you, Saul. The poor thing's as wet as he can be. And don't you reckon it may be he's hungry? True for you, Rachel, I forgot. So the old lady says, Betsy, this was a nigger woman, you fly round and get him something to eat as quick as you can, poor thing. And one of you girls go and wake up Buck and tell him, Oh, here he is himself. Buck, take this little stranger and get the wet clothes off of him and dress him up in some of yours that's dry. Buck looked about as old as me, thirteen or fourteen or along there, although he's a little bigger than me. He hadn't on anything but a shirt, and he was very frowsy-headed. He came in gapping and digging one fist into his eyes, and he was dragging a gun along with the other one. He says, Ain't there no Shepherdsons around? They said no, twas a false alarm. Well, he says, if they'd have been some, I reckon I'd have got one. They all laughed, and Bob says, 
Why, Buck, they might have scalped us all. You've been so slow in coming. Well, nobody come after me, and it ain't right I'm always kept down. I don't get no show. Never mind, Buck, my boy, says the old man. You'll have show enough all in good time, don't you fret about that. Go along with you now, and do as your mother told you. When we got upstairs to his room, he got me a coarse shirt and a roundabout and pants of his, and I put them on. While I was at it, he asked me what my name was, but before I could tell him, he started to tell me about a blue jay and a young rabbit he had catched on the woods day before yesterday, and he asked me where Moses was when the candle went out. I said I didn't know. I hadn't heard about it before, no way. Well, guess, he says. How am I going to guess, says I, when I never heard tell of it before? But you can guess, can't you? It's just as easy. Which candle? I says. Why, any candle, he says. I don't know where he was, says I. Where was he? Why, he was in the dark. That's where he was. Well, if you knowed where he was, what did you ask me for? Why, blame it, it's a riddle, don't you see? Say, how long are you going to stay there? You got to stay always. We can just have booming times. They don't have no school now. Do you own a dog? I got a dog. He'll go in the river and bring out chips that you throw in. Do you like to comb up Sundays and all that kind of foolishness? You bet I don't, but Ma, she makes me. Confound these old britches. I reckon I'd better put em on, but I'd rather not. It's so warm. Are you all ready? All right. Come along, old hoss. Cold corn pone, cold corn beef, butter and buttermilk. That is what they had for me down there, and there ain't nothing better that ever I've come across yet. Buck and his ma and all of them smoked cob pipes, except the nigger woman, which was gone, and the two young women. They all smoked and talked, and I eat and talked. The young women had quilts around them, and their hair down their backs. They all asked me questions, and I told them how Pap and me and all the family was living on a little farm down at the bottom of Arkansas, and my sister Mary Ann run off and got married, and never was heard of no more and Bill went to hunt them, and he warn't heard of no more. And Tom and Mort died, and then there warn't nobody but just me and Pap left. He was just trimmed down to nothing, on account of his troubles. So when he died, I took what there was left, because the farm didn't belong to us, and started up the river, deck passage, and fell overboard, and that was how I come to be here. So they said I could have a home there as long as I wanted it. Then it was most daylight, and everybody went to bed, and I went to bed with Buck, and when I waked up in the morning, drat it all, I had forgot what my name was. So I laid there about an hour trying to think, and when Buck waked up, I says, Can you spell Buck? Yes, he says. I bet you can't spell my name, says I. I bet you what you dare I can, says he. All right, says I. Go ahead. G-E-O-R-G-E -E -E. J-A-X-O-N There now, he says. Well, says I, you done it, but I didn't think you could. It ain't no slouch of a name to spell, right off without studying. I set it down private because somebody might want me to spell it next, and so I wanted to be handy with it and rattle it off just like I was used to it. It was a mighty nice family, and a mighty nice house, too. I hadn't seen no house out in the country before that was so nice and had so much style. It didn't have an iron latch on the front door, nor a wooden one with a buckskin string, but a brass knob to turn, the same as houses in town. There weren't no bed in the parlor, nor a sign of a bed, but heaps of parlors and towns has beds in them. There was a big fireplace that was bricked on the bottom, and the bricks was kept clean and red by pouring water on them and scrubbing them with another brick. Sometimes they wash them over with red water paint that they call Spanish brown, same as they do in town. 
They had big brass dog irons that could hold up a saw log. There was a clock on the middle of the mantelpiece, with a picture of a town painted on the bottom half of the glass front, and a round place in the middle of it for the sun, and you could see the pendulum swinging behind it. It was beautiful to hear that clock tick, and sometimes when one of these peddlers had been along and scoured her up and got her in good shape, she would start in and strike a hundred and fifty before she got duckered out. They wouldn't took any money for her. Well, there was a big outlandish parrot on each side of the clock, made out of something like chalk, and painted up gaudy. By one of the parrots was a cat made of crockery, and a crockery dog by the other, and when you press down on them they squeak, but didn't open their mouths nor look different nor interested. They squeaked through underneath. There was a couple of big wild turkey wing fans spread out behind these things. On the table in the middle of the room was a kind of a lovely crockery basket that had apples and oranges and peaches and grapes piled up in it, which was much redder and yellower and prettier than real ones is, but they weren't real because you could see there was pieces that got chipped off and showed the white chalk, or whatever it was, underneath. This table had a cover made out of a beautiful oilcloth, with a red and blue spread eagle painted on it and a painted border all around. It come all the way from Philadelphia, they said. There was some books, too, piled up perfectly exact on each corner of the table. One was a big family Bible full of pictures. One was Pilgrim's Progress, about a man that left his family, it didn't say why. I read considerable in it now and then. The statements was interesting, but tough. Another was Friendship's Offering, full of beautiful stuff and poetry, but I didn't read the poetry. Another was Henry Clay's speeches, and another was Dr. Gunn's family medicine, which told you all about what to do if a body was sick or dead. There was a hymn book and a lot of other books, and there was nice split-bottom chairs, and perfectly sound, too, not bagged down in the middle and busted like an old basket. They had pictures hung on the walls, mainly Washingtons and Lafayettes, and Battles, and Highland Marys, and one called Signing the Declaration. There were some that they called crayons, which one of the daughters which was dead made her own self when she was only fifteen years old. They was different from any pictures I ever see before, blacker mostly than is common. One was a woman in a slim black dress, belted small under the armpits, with bulges like a cabbage in the middle of the sleeves, and a large black scoop-shovel bonnet with a black veil, and white slim ankles crossed about with black tape, and very wee black slippers, like a chisel, and she was leaning pensive on a tombstone on her right elbow, under a weeping willow, and her other hand hanging down her side holding a white handkerchief and a reticule, and underneath the picture it said, Shall I never see thee more, alas? Another one was a young lady with her hair all combed up straight to the top of her head, and nodded there in front of a comb like a chair-back, and she was crying into a handkerchief, and had a dead bird laying on its back in her other hand with its heels up. And underneath the picture it said, I shall never hear thy sweet chirrup more, alas and there was one where a young lady was at a window looking up at the moon, and tears running down her cheeks, and she had an open letter in one hand with black sealing wax showing on one edge of it, and she was mashing a locket with a chain to it against her mouth, and underneath the picture it said, And art thou gone, yes, thou art gone, alas. And these was all nice pictures, I reckon, but I didn't somehow seem to take to them, because if ever I was down a little, they always give me the fantods. Everybody was sorry she died, because she had laid out a lot more of these pictures to do, and a body could see by what she had done what they had lost. But I reckoned that with her disposition she was having a better time in the graveyard. She was at work on what they said was her greatest picture when she took sick and every day and every night it was her prayer to be allowed to live till she got it done, but she never got the chance. It was a picture of a young woman in a long white gown, 
standing on the rail of a bridge all ready to jump off, with her hair all down her back, and looking up to the moon, and with the tears running down her face, and she had two arms folded across her breast, and two arms stretched out in front, and two more reaching up towards the moon, and the idea was to see which pair would look best, and then scratch out all the other arms. But, as I was saying, she died before she got her mind made up, and now they kept this picture over the head of the bed in her room, and every time her birthday come they hung flowers on it. Other times it was hid with a little curtain. The young woman in the picture had a kind of a nice sweet face, but there were so many arms it made her look too spidery, it seemed to me. This young girl kept a scrapbook while she was alive, and used to pace obituaries and accidents and cases of patient suffering in it out of the Presbyterian Observer, and write poetry after them out of her own head. It was very good poetry. This is what she wrote down about a boy by the name of Stephen Dowling Botts that fell down a well and was drowned. Ode to Stephen Dowling Botts, Deceased and did young Stephen sicken, and did young Stephen die, and did the sad hearts thicken, and did the mourners cry? No, such was not the face of young Stephen Dowling Botts, though sad hearts round him thickened, t'was not from sickness shots. No whooping cough did rack his frame, nor measles drear with spots, not these impaired the sacred name of Stephen Dowling Botts. Despised love struck not with woe that head of curly knots, nor stomach troubles laid him low, young Stephen Dowling Botts. Oh, no, then list with tearful eye, whilst I his fate do tell. His soul did from this cold world fly by falling down a well. They got him out and emptied him. Alas, it was too late. His spirit was gone for to sport aloft in the realms of the good and great. If Emmeline Grangerford could make poetry like that before she was fourteen, there ain't no telling what she could have done by and by. Buck said she could rattle off poetry like nothing. She didn't ever have to stop to think. He said she would slap down a line, and if she couldn't find anything to rhyme with it, would just scratch it out and slap down another one, and go ahead. She warn't particular. She could write about anything you choose to give her to write about, just so it was sadful. Every time a man died, or a woman died, or a child died, she would be on hand with her tribute before he was cold. She called them tributes. The neighbor said it was the doctor first, then Emmeline, then the undertaker. The undertaker never got in ahead of Emmeline but once, and then she hung fire on a rhyme for the dead person's name, which was Whistler. She warn't ever the same after that. She never complained, but she kind of pined away and did not live long. Poor thing, many's the time I made myself go up to the little room that used to be hers and get out her poor old scrapbook and read in it when her pictures had been aggravating me and I had soured on her a little. I liked all that family, dead ones and all, and weren't going to let anything come between us. Poor Emmeline made poetry about all the dead people when she was alive, and it didn't seem right that there weren't nobody to make some about her now she was gone. So I tried to sweat out a verse or two myself, but I couldn't seem to make it go somehow. They kept Emmeline's room trim and nice, and all the things fixed in it just the way she liked to have them when she was alive, and nobody ever slept there. The old lady took care of the room herself, though there was plenty of niggers, and she sewed there a good deal, and read her Bible there mostly. Well, as I was going to say about the parlor, there was beautiful curtains on the windows, white, with pictures painted on them of castles with vines all down the walls, and cattle coming down to drink. There was a little old piano, too, that had tin pans in it, I reckon, and nothing was ever so lovely as to hear the young ladies sing, The Last Link is Broken, and play, the Battle of Prague, on it. The walls of all the rooms was plastered, and most had carpets on the floors, and the whole house was whitewashed on the outside. It was a double house, and the big open place betwixt them was roofed and floored, 
and sometimes the table was set there in the middle of the day, and it was a cool, comfortable place. Nothing couldn't be better, and warn't the cooking good, and just bushels of it, too. End of chapter. Wayne. Chapter 18. Colonel Grangerford was a gentleman, you see. He was a gentleman all over, and so was his family. He was well born, as the saying is, and that's worth as much in a man as it is in a horse, so the widow Douglas said, and nobody ever denied that she was of the first aristocracy in our town. And Pap, he always said it, too, though he warn't no more quality than a mud-cat himself. Colonel Grangerford was very tall and very slim, and had a darkish, paley complexion, not a sign of red in it anywheres. He was clean-shaved every morning all over his thin face, and he had the thinnest kind of lips, and the thinnest kind of nostrils, and a high nose, and heavy eyebrows, and the blackest kind of eyes sunk so deep back that they seemed like they was looking out of caverns at you, as you may say. His forehead was high, and his hair was black and straight, and hung to his shoulders. His hands was long and thin and every day of his life he put on a clean shirt and a full suit from head to foot, made out of linen so white it hurt your eyes to look at it. And on Sundays he wore a blue tailcoat with brass buttons on it. He carried a mahogany cane with a silver head to it. There weren't no frivolousness about him, not a bit, and he weren't ever loud. He was as kind as he could be. You could feel that, you know, and so you had confidence." Sometimes he smiled, and it was good to see. But when he straightened himself up like a liberty pole, and the lightning begun to flicker out from under his eyebrows, you wanted to climb a tree first, and find out what the matter was afterwards. He did never have to tell anybody to mind their manners. Everybody was always good-mannered where he was. Everybody loved to have him around, too. He was sunshine most always. I mean he made it seem like good weather. When he turned into a cloud bank it was awful dark for half a minute, and that was enough. There would not nothing go wrong again for a week. When him and the old lady came down in the morning all the family got up out of their chairs and gave them good day, and didn't sit down again till they had sat down. When Tom and Bob went to the sideboard where the decanter was, and mixed a glass of bitters and handed it to him, and he held it in his hand and waited till Tom's and Bob's was mixed, and then they bowed and said, Our duty to you, sir and madam, and they bowed the least bit in the world and said thank you, and so they drank, all three, and Bob and Tom poured a spoonful of water on the sugar and the mite of whiskey or apple brandy in the bottom of their tumblers, and give it to me and Buck and we drank to the old people, too. Bob was the oldest, and Tom next. Tall, beautiful men with very broad shoulders and brown faces, and long black hair and black eyes. They dressed in white linen from head to foot, like the old gentleman, and wore broad Panama hats. Then there was Miss Charlotte. She was twenty-five, and tall and proud and grand, but as good as she could be when she weren't stirred up. But when she was, she had a look that would make you wilt in your tracks, like her father. She was beautiful. So was her sister, Miss Sophia, but it was a different kind. She was gentle and sweet like a dove, and she was only twenty. Each person had their own nigger to wait on them, Buck too. My nigger had a monstrous easy time, because I weren't used to having anybody do anything for me but Bucks was on the jump most of the time. This was all there was of the family now, but there used to be more. Three sons, they got killed, and Emmeline that died. The old gentleman owned a lot of farms and over a hundred niggers. Sometimes a stack of people would come there, horseback, from ten or fifteen mile around, and stay five or six days, and have such junketings round about and on the river and dances and picnics in the woods daytimes, and balls at the house nights. These people was mostly kinfolks of the family. The men brought their guns with them. It was a handsome lot of quality, I tell you. 
There was another clan of aristocracy around there, five or six families, mostly of the name of Shepherdson. They was as high-toned and well-born and rich and grand as the tribe of Grangerfords. The Shepherdsons and Grangerfords used the same steamboat landing, which was about two mile above our house. So sometimes when I went up there with a lot of our folks, I used to see a lot of the Shepherdsons there on their fine horses. One day Buck and me was away out in a woods hunting, and heard a horse coming. We was crossing the road. Buck says, Quick, jump for the woods. We done it, and then peeped down the woods through the leaves. Pretty soon a splendid young man come galloping down the road, setting his horse easy and looking like a soldier. He had his gun across his pommel. I had seen him before. It was young Harney Shepherdson. I heard Buck's gun go off at my ear, and Harney's hat tumbled off from his head. He grabbed his gun and rode straight to the place where we was hid. But we didn't wait. We started through the woods on a run. The words weren't thick, so I looked over my shoulder to dodge the bullet, and twice I seen Harney cover Buck with his gun, and then he rode away the way he come. To get his hat I reckon, but I couldn't see. We never stopped running till we got home. The old gentleman's eyes blazed a minute. Twas pleasure mainly, I judged. Then his face sort of smoothed down, and he says, kind of gentle, "'I don't like that shooting from behind a bush. Why didn't you step into the road, my boy?' "'The Shepherdsons don't, father. They always take advantage.' Miss Charlotte, she held her head up like a queen while Buck was telling his tale, and her nostrils spread and her eyes snapped. The two young men looked dark, but never said nothing. Miss Sophia, she turned pale, but the color come back when she found the man weren't hurt. Soon as I could get Buck down by the corn cribs under the trees by ourselves, I says, "'Did you want to kill him, Buck?' "'Well, I bet I did.' What did he do to you? Him? He never done nothing to me. Well, then, what did you want to kill him for? Why, nothing. Only it's on account of the feud. What's a feud? Why, where was you raised? Don't you know what a feud is? Never heard of it before. Tell me about it. Well, says Buck, a feud is this way. A man has a quarrel with another man, and kills him. Then that other man's brother kills him. Then the other brothers, on both sides, go for one another. Then the cousins chip in, and by and by everybody's killed off, and there ain't no more feud. But it's kind of slow, and takes a long time. Has this one been going on long, Buck? Well, I should reckon it started thirty year ago or summers along there. There was trouble about something, and then a lawsuit to settle it, and the suit went again one of the men, and so he up and shot the man that won the suit, which he would naturally do, of course. Anybody would. What was the trouble about, Buck? Land? I reckon maybe. I don't know. Well, who done the shooting? Was it a Grangerford or a Shepherdson? Laws, how do I know? It was so long ago. Don't anybody know? Oh, yes, Pa knows, I reckon, and some of the other old people, but they don't know now what the row was about in the first place. Has there been many killed, Puck? Yes, right smart chance of funerals, but they don't always kill. Paul's got a few buckshot in him, but he don't mind it cause he don't weigh much. Anyway, Bob's been carved up some with a buoy, and Tom's been hurt once or twice. Has anybody been killed this year, Buck? Yes, we got one, and they got one. About three months ago my cousin Bud, fourteen year old, was riding through the woods on the other side of the river, and didn't have no weapon with him, which was blame foolishness, and in a lonesome place he hears a horse a-coming behind him and sees old Baldy Shepherdson a linkin' after him with his gun in his hand and his white hair a-flyin' in the wind. And instead of jumpin' off and takin' to the brush, Bud lowed he could run him. 
So they had it, nip and tuck, for five mile or more, the old man a gainin' all the time. So at last Bud seen it warn't any use, so he stopped and faced around so as to have the bullet holes in front, you know, and the old man he rode up and shot him down. But he didn't get much chance to enjoy his luck, for inside of a week our folks laid him out. I reckon that old man was a coward, Buck. I reckon he warn't a coward. Not by blame sight. There ain't a coward amongst them Shepherdsons, not a one. And there ain't no cowards amongst the Grangerfords either. Why, that old man kept up his end in a fight one day for half an hour against three Grangerfords, and come out winner. They was all a horseback. He lit off of his horse and got behind a little woodpile, and kept his horse before him to stop the bullets. But the Grangerfords stayed on their horses, and capered around the old man, and peppered away at him, and he peppered away at them. Him and his horse both went home pretty leaky and crippled, but the Grangerfords had to be fetched home, and one of them was dead, and another died the next day. No, sir, if a body's out hunting for cowards, he don't want to fool away any time amongst them Shepherdsons, because they don't breed any of that kind. Next Sunday we all went to church, about three mile, everybody a horseback. The men took their guns along, so did Buck, and kept them between their knees or stood them handy against the wall. The Shepherdsons done the same. It was pretty ornery preaching, all about brotherly love and such like tiresomeness, but everybody said it was a good sermon, and they all talked it over going home had such a powerful lot to say about faith and good works and free grace and pre or destination and I don't know what all, that it did seem to me to be one of the roughest Sundays I had run across yet. About an hour after dinner everybody was dozing around, some in their chairs and some in their rooms, and it got to be pretty dull. Buck and a dog were stretched out on the grass in the sun, sound asleep. I went up to our room, and judged I would take a nap myself. I found that sweet Miss Sophia standing in her door, which was next to ours, and she took me in her room and shut the door very soft, and asked me if I liked her, and I said I did. And she asked me if I would do something for her and not tell anybody, and I said I would. Then she said she'd forgot her testament and left it in the seat at church between two other books and would I slip out quiet and go there and fetch it to her, and not say nothing to nobody? I said I would. So I slid out and slipped off up the road, and there warn't anybody at the church, except maybe a hog or two, for there warn't any lock on the door, and hogs lights a punching floor in summertime because it's cool. If you notice, most folks don't go to church only when they've got to, but a hog is different. Says I to myself, something's up. It ain't natural for a girl to be in such a sweat about a testament. So I give it a shake, and out drops a little piece of paper with half-past two wrote on it with a pencil. I ransacked it, but I couldn't find anything else. I couldn't make anything out of that, so I put the paper in the book again, and when I got home and upstairs there was Miss Sophia in her door waiting for me. She pulled me in and shut the door. Then she looked in the testament till she found the paper, and as soon as she read it she looked glad, and before a body could think she grabbed me and give me a squeeze, and said I was the best boy in the world, and not to tell anybody. She was mighty red in the face for a minute, and her eyes lighted up, and it made her powerful pretty. I was a good deal astonished. But when I got my breath, I asked her what the paper was about, and she asked me if I'd read it. I said no, and she asked me if I could read writing, and I told her, no, only coarse hand. And then she said the paper warn't anything but a bookmark to keep her place, and I might go and play now. I went off down the river, studying over this thing. Pretty soon I noticed that my nigger was following along behind. When we was out of sight of the house, he looked back and around a second, and then comes a running and says, "Mars George, if you come down into the swamp, I'll show you a whole stack of water moccasins." 
thinks I, that's mighty curious. He said that yesterday. He ought to know a body don't love water moccasins enough to go round hunting for them. What is he up to anyway? So I says, All right, trot ahead. I followed a half a mile. Then he struck out over the swamp, and waded ankle-deep as much as another half-mile. We come to a little flat piece of land which was dry and very thick with trees and bushes and vines, and he says, "'You shove right in there just a few steps, Mars George. That's where they is. I'd seen em before. I don't care to see em no more.' Then he slopped right along and went away, and pretty soon the trees hit him. I poked into the place a ways, and come to a little open patch as big as a bedroom, all hung around with vines, and found a man laying there asleep, and by jings it was my old Jim. I waked him up, and I reckon it was going to be a grand surprise to him to see me again, but it warn't. He nearly cried he was so glad, but he warn't surprised. Said he swum along behind me that night and heard me yell every time, but dasn't answer because he didn't want nobody to pick him up and take him into slavery again. Says he, I got hurt a little, and couldn't swim fast, so I was a considerable ways behind you towards the last. When you landed I reckoned I could catch up with you on the land, without having to shout at you, but when I see that house I begin to go slow. I was off too fur to hear what they say to you. I was afraid of the dogs, but when it was all quiet again, I knowed you was in the house, so I struck out for the woods to wait for day. Early in the morning some of the niggers come along, gwine to the fields, and they took me and showed me this place, where the dogs can't track me on accounts of the water, and they brings me truck to eat every night, and tells me how you's a getting along. Why didn't you tell my Jack to fetch me here sooner, Jim? Well, twarn't no use to disturb you, Huck, till we could do something. But we's all right now. I've been a buyin' pots and pans and vittles, as I got a chance, and a patchin' up the raft nights when— What raft, Jim? Our old raft. You mean to say our old raft weren't smashed all to flinders? No, she warn't. She was tore up a good deal. One end of her was, but there weren't no great arm done, only our traps was most all loss. If we hadn't dived so deep and swum so fur under water, and the night hadn't been so dark, and we weren't so skeered, and been such punkin heads, as the sayin' is, we'd a see the raft. But it's just as well we didn't, cause now she's all fixed up again most as good as new and we's got a new lot of stuff in the place of what is lost. Why, how did you get hold of the raft again, Jim? Did you catch her? How I gwine to catch her and I out in the woods? No, some of the niggers found her catched on a snag along here in the bend, and they hid her in a crick amongst the willows, and they was so much jawing about which of em she belonged to the most that I come to hear about it pretty soon, and I ups and settles the trouble by telling them she don't belong to none of em, but to you and me, and I asked em if they gwine to grab a young white gentleman's property and get a hidin' for it. Then I give em ten cents apiece, and they is mighty well satisfied, and wish some more rafts had come along and make em rich again. They is mighty good to me, these niggers is. And whatever I wants em to do for me, I don't have to ask em twice, honey. That Jack's a good nigger, and pretty smart. Yes, he is. He ain't ever told me you was here. Told me to come, and he'd show me a lot of water moccasins. If anything happens, he ain't mixed up in it. He can say he never seen us together, and it'll be the truth. I don't want to talk much about the next day. I reckon I'll cut it pretty short. I waked up about dawn and was a-going to turn over and go to sleep again when I noticed how still it was. Didn't seem to be anybody stirring. That warn't usual. Next I noticed that Buck was up and gone. Well, I gets up a-wandering and goes downstairs. Nobody around. 
everything is still as a mouse, just the same outside. Thinks I, what does it mean? Down by the woodpile I comes across my jack and says, What's it all about? Says he, Don't you know Mars George? No, says I, I, I don't. Well, then, Miss Sophia's run off. Deed she has. She run off in the night sometime. Nobody don't know just when. Run off to get married to that young Harness Shepherdson, you know. Leastwise, so they spec. The family found it out about half an hour ago, maybe a little more. And I tell you, they want no time's loss. Such another hurrying up guns and horses you never see. The women folks has gone for to stir up the relations, and old Marsal and the boys tucked the guns and rode up the river road for to try and catch that young man and kill him, fore he can get across the river with Miss Sophia. I reckon there's going to be mighty rough times. Buck went off without waking me up. Well, I reckon he did. They weren't going to mix you up in it. Mars Buck, he loaded up his gun and loud he's going to fetch home a Shepherdson or bust. Well, there'll be plenty of em there, I reckon, and you bet you, he'll fetch one if he gets a chance. I took up the river road as hard as I could get. By and by I began to hear guns a good ways off. When I come in sight of the log store and the woodpile where the steamboats lands, I worked along under the trees and brush till I got to a good place and then I clumb up into the forks of a cottonwood that was out of reach, and watched. There was a wood rank four foot high a little ways in front of the tree, and first I was going to hide behind that, but maybe it was luckier I didn't. There was four or five men cavorting around on their horses in the open place before the log store, cussing and yelling, and trying to get at a couple of young chaps that was behind the wood rank alongside of the steamboat landing but they couldn't come it. Every time one of them showed himself on the river side of the woodpile, he got shot at. The two boys were squatting back to back behind the pile, so they could watch both ways. By and by, the men stopped cavorting around and yelling. They started riding towards the store, then up gets one of the boys, draws a steady beat over the wood rank, and drops one of them out of his saddle. All the men jumped off their horses and grabbed the hurt one, and started to carry him to the store. And that minute the two boys started on the run. They got halfway to the tree I was in before the men noticed. Then the men see them, and jumped on their horses and took out after them. They gained on the boys, but it didn't do no good. The boys had too good a start. They got to the woodpile that was in front of my tree, and slipped in behind it, and so they had the bulge on the men again. One of the boys was Buck, and the other was a slim young chap about nineteen years old. Men ripped around a while and then rode away. As soon as they was out of sight, I sung out to Buck and told him. He didn't know what to make of my voice coming out of the tree at first. He was awful surprised. He told me to watch out sharp and let him know when the men come in sight again said they was up to some devilment or other. Couldn't be gone long. I wished I was out of that tree, but I dasn't come down. Buck begun to cry and rip, and loud that him and his cousin Joe, that was the other young chap, would make up for this day yet. He said his father and his two brothers was killed, and two or three of the enemy. Said the Shepherdsons laid for them in ambush. Buck said his father and brothers ought to have waited for their relations. The Shepherdsons was too strong for them. I asked him what was become of young Harney and Miss Sophia. He said they got across the river and was safe. I was glad of that. But the way Buck did take on, because he didn't manage to kill Harney that day he shot at him, I ain't ever heard anything like it. All of a sudden, bang, 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 goes three or four guns. The men had slipped around through the woods and come in from behind without their horses. The boys jumped for the river, both of them hurt, and as they swum down the current the men run along the bank, shooting at them and singing out, Kill them! Kill them! It made me so sick I most fell out of the tree. I ain't a going to tell all that happened. 
It would make me sick again if I was to do that. I wished I hadn't ever come ashore that night to see such things. I ain't ever going to get shut of them. Lots of times I dream about them. I stayed in the tree till it begun to get dark, afraid to come down. Sometimes I heard guns away off in the woods, and twice I seen little gangs of men gallop past the log store with guns, so I reckoned the trouble was still a going on. I was mighty downhearted, so I made up my mind I wouldn't ever go a near that house again, because I reckoned I was to blame somehow. I judged that that piece of paper meant that Miss Sophia was to meet Harney somewheres at half-past two and run off. And I judged I ought to told her father about that paper, and the curious way she acted, and then maybe he would have locked her up, and this awful mess wouldn't ever happened. When I got down out of the tree I crept along down the river bank a piece, and found the two bodies laying in the edge of the water, and tugged at them till I got them ashore. Then I covered up their faces and got away as quick as I could. I cried a little when I was covering up Buck's face, for he was mighty good to me. It was just dark now. I never went near the house, but struck through the woods and made for the swamp. Jim weren't on his Allen, so I tramped off in a hurry for the crick, and crowded through the willows, red-hot to jump aboard and get out of that awful country. The raft was gone. My souls, but I was scared. I couldn't get my breath for most a minute. Then I raised a yell. A voice not twenty-five foot from me says, "'Good land, that you, honey? Don't make no noise.' It was Jim's voice. Nothing ever sounded so good before. I run along the bank a piece and got aboard, and Jim he grabbed me and hugged me. He was so glad to see me. He says, "'Laws bless you, child. I was right down show you's dead again. Jack's been here.' He say he reckon you's been shot, cause you didn't come home no more, and I's just this minute a startin' to raft down towards the mouth of the creek, so as be all ready for to shove out and leave soon as Jack comes again and tells me for certain you is dead. Lawsy, I's mighty glad to get you back again, honey. I says, All right, that's mighty good. They won't find me and they'll think I've been killed, and floated down the river. There's something up there that'll help them think so. So don't you lose no time, Jim, but just shove off for the big water as fast as ever you can. I never felt easy till the raft was two mile below there and out in the middle of the Mississippi. Then we hung up our signal lantern, and judged that we was free and safe once more. I hadn't had a bite to eat since yesterday, so Jim he got out some corn dodgers and buttermilk, and pork and cabbage and greens. There ain't nothing in the world so good when it's cooked right. And whilst I eat my supper we talked and had a good time. I was powerful glad to get away from the feuds, and so was Jim to get away from the swamp. We said there warn't no home like a raft, after all. Other places do seem so cramped up and smothery, but a raft don't. You feel mighty free and easy and comfortable on a raft. End of chapter.